Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Excellent. It's great to see you here, having survived snow apocalypses and stuff to get here. And I think we're going to dodge a snowstorm that we were going to have a few days ago tomorrow. So hopefully you'll see Milwaukee in a perfect light. Um, welcome to Milwaukee Rep. Uh, my name is Mark Clements. I'm the artistic director. To my right, it's Chad Bauman. Uh, managing Director, and we are absolutely thrilled to have you here at this very first Intersection Summit. Yes. So we're gathering today in our uh, deep belief that the theater can create bridges between disparate communities, uh, bring us together in the examination of varying worldviews, and discover creative ways in which the arts can address community needs and maximize collective opportunities. After six decades here at Milwaukee Rep, uh, we changed our mission a couple of years ago to focus on creative positive change in our community through plays that inspire, provoke, and entertain an audience representative of the city's rich diversity. This change put us on a path to launching IMPACT, our engagement and education initiative that uses the unique talents of our artisans and the theater to propel our community forward. In this room, we have some of the most forward-thinking minds in engagement, education, and leadership uh, gathered here for the summit. We're really excited about the opportunity to hear and to learn from you. At a moment when the country is clearly divided, and uh, our theaters offer spaces that are welcome, welcoming, inspirational to all, where diverse opinions, dissent, and civil debate are not only to tolerated, but invited and where active listening and courageous exchange are valued. Exercising uh, empathy and understanding can begin with us. As Milwaukee Rep trustee Ed Akhtar reminds us, uh, theater is uniquely designed to build community. It's a communal experience. By definition, in an age of virtuality, it requires presence. And at its best, theater creates a sense of shared experience and sparks a conversation in no way that any other art form can. The nation needs its artists, perhaps now more than ever, to help us empathize with each other and build a shared vision for our country. Know that whatever you're feeling today, uh, stresses, life stresses, your work matters, you matter, and we remain hopeful that we can build a better tomorrow together. In this spirit, we hope that the summit offers a platform for reflection inquiry, collaboration, and we all work to determine what our next steps are collectively as a field and in our own individual practices. So we'd like to invite a quick moment to recognize and thank the staff of Milwaukee Repertory Theater, and in particular, Courtney McInery, Nebra Nelson. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> Never Nelson and Ginny Toutant for their tireless work today. I was joking earlier, we are not conference people, we are theater people. So, um, uh, but uh, as, as Milwaukeeans, we are welcoming people. So hopefully you will feel that uh, uh, in the next couple of days. Additionally, uh, I wanna say a, a very sincere thank you to the Summit Planning Committee, including Marcy Bermusi, Leah Harris, Anita maynard Loesch, Anita, my former colleague, thank you. I'm, we're so welcome that you're here. Courtney as well, Chris Moses, Erica Nagel, Nebra Nelson, Jesus Reyes, Willa, Willa Taylor, Jenny Tutown, and Mark Valdez. Thank you to them. I just want to, I'm going to go off script for just two seconds. Uh oh. <laughs> I, just to think that li literally two years ago, we didn't have a community engagement department in our organization. So I also want to give out an additional shout out to Lita Hoffman, who took on that role initially. There's Lita. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and said, put some exciting things together for us to talk about. Let's get us all kind of talking. And she got that going. And then we were really fortunate to hire NABRA and then fortunately to get Courtney, who actually have just been the engine of this, and I'm just so in admiration for their efforts and just what has happened in such a short time. It just shows that if there is desire that, and if there's a will, there's a way. Um, so without much further ado, I would like to introduce the chair of Milwaukee Rep's Impact Council and the retired president of Northwestern Mutual Foundation, 
Uh, he's a, been a long-term board member. He's a fantastic friend of the theatre and a friend, um, someone extremely inspiring to us all here, John Cordsmeyer. Hey, good afternoon. And now for something completely different. <laughs> Welcome to Milwaukee, part of our country's wonderful fresh coast. As you wander around our city, you'll no doubt see a city in transition, continuing to honor our past, but leaning into our future. As you walk around downtown, you'll see world-class architecture and entertainment and sports venues, as well as these beautiful historic buildings, impeccably maintained, alongside brand new developments that blend Milwaukee's past and its exciting future. Even more important to me personally, though, is the work you may not see. It's the work being undertaken by residents in neighborhoods all across this city. I want you to know that what you have seen on the news about Milwaukee's many challenges is largely true, but also incomplete. Each and every day, people living in our neighborhoods are doing innovative, heroic, and game-changing work, accepting the challenge of driving positive change in the face of many, many significant challenges. Thank you. And this space is one that I see the marriage of art and community engagement working and contributing to collective efficacy. The name Milwaukee itself, I don't know if you know this or not, comes from an Algonquin word meaning good, beautiful, or pleasant land. Other interpretations say it's a Potawatomi phrase, which is a gathering place by the waters. No immigrant lived where Milwaukee stands today until 1675. But our natives, the original people of this land, first appeared here almost 12,000 years ago. Nine different tribes lived near the confluence of our three rivers, the Milwaukee, the Menominee, and the Kennekenek rivers at one time or another. The four largest tribes here were the Potawatomi, the Chippewa, the Ottawa, and the Menominee. So Milwaukee arose from tribal lands. We, and now you, all of you, are surrounded by sacred places. Later, immigrants from across the world settled in Milwaukee and contributed to the evolution of the city as it is today. Now, I've been asked why engagement in the arts matters to me. And honestly, over the years, the answer has evolved from one point to the next. And now, what I say is it matters most to me because, one, I personally know an energetic, talented six-year-old boy being raised by a single college-educated mother living in one of our most distressed communities. That boy's involvement in the arts is a window into a different future for himself. I know a 13-year-old boy who's a neuroblastoma cancer survivor whose participation has meant growth, but more importantly, literally healing for himself, but also the fellow, fellow artists that he knows. You see, kids with cancer still want to be kids. Arts provide that opportunity. For members of the Feast of Crispin, Crispian, a nonprofit organization bringing together professional actors with post-deployment service veterans it means teaching and strengthening emotional resources that they need to overcome traumatic and reintegration issues. And it's going very well and strong in Milwaukee. In Milwaukee and elsewhere, there are far too many of our children who live with significant childhood trauma. Oprah spoke about this just recently on 60 Minutes. The arts provide a method for surfacing the source of the trauma and helping our youth discover a path to their future. 
Now, before I go on to the introduction of the keynote, I want to say one thing. Just checking the list that Courtney gave me for speaking for today. One, I want to offer my thoughts and prayers to you as you start this conference. Second, in big letters it says, don't say congratulations. <laughs> and lastly, I want you to know I hear you. And if you don't believe me, here's what she wrote. I hear you. <laughs> now on to our keynote. Uh, and this is something completely different because I've arranged this in a way, and I asked uh, Carmen in advance if it's OK, and she gave me permission, because otherwise it would have to be absolution. <laughs> I've asked three of your attendees to do part of the introduction today. So I'm going to ask those three individuals to walk down and to stand at the bottom of the front row. And Courtney's going to pass a mic. Come on, you remember who you are. <laughs> and we're going to hear introductions in the voice of. This is about acting, theater, right? <laughs> so our first is going to be introducing Carmen in the voice of an agent. Carmen is a national consultant leading conversations at the forefront of the field on equity, diversity, and inclusion issues. She is the founder and director of Art Equity, a national program that provides tools, resources, and training to support the intersections of art and activism. She has provided leadership development, organizational planning, and coaching for staff, executives, and boards of over 100 nonprofit organizations. She is on the faculty faculty of Yale School of Drama, where she addresses issues of equity, identity, and inclusion in the arts for the past eight years. She has worked with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival on structural and organizational equity. With her guidance, OSF has implemented innovative programming, policies, and new organizational structures to support ongoing inclusion efforts. In addition, she serves as the consultant for theater communication groups, diversity and inclusion initiatives and programming, where she has partnered with TCG to launch a national. Okay, we all know agents get carried away, and Carmen has to cut it right there. Let's move on. So now we're going to hear from her biggest fan ever. Oh my God, I'm so nervous. <laughs> For the past 15 years, Carmen directed leadership development in inter-ethnic relations, a nationally recognized social justice program co-sponsored by Asian Americans Advancing Justice, the, Center, the Central American Resource Center, and the Martin Luther King Dispute Resolution Center. Prior to her work with the LDIR program, Carmen was the Associate Regional Director for the American Friends Service Committee an international human rights organization where she oversaw human rights work on the US-Mexico border, gay liberation and sovereignty education work in Hawaii, and tenant rights and racial and economic justice work in California and Arizona. Carmen is a founding member of the California chapter of the National Association for Multicultural Education, a former human services commissioner. <laughs> All right, I can't now we know, truly her biggest fan, but now, most importantly, you're going to hear from the perspective of her mother. If mama loves you so much. <laughs> Carmen's work is rooted in popular education, community organizing, and a commitment to social justice. She remains dedicated to community building and activism, and has worked in the nonprofit sector for over 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the four of us and the Milwaukee Rep, its Board of Trustees, and all of its staff and artists and members of the crew, welcome to the stage, Carmen. never meant to be read out loud like that, ever. <laughs> That's lesson learned, lesson learned. Okay, I will, I'll, next time I will really, I'll spend more time really. Hi everybody. I'm gonna have some water. Oh my gosh, it's really delightful to be here. Let me see, okay, I'll put this here. Um, wow, well, so, 
Uh, Courtney, I was planning to say congratulations too, but I want to just make sure, is that, was there, are we okay? Can I do that? It feels like, yeah, okay. Folks, wonderful, wonderful. I would like to say, first and foremost, I was gonna say congratulations for the very first um, Intersection Summit on um, community engagement. Here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and also, obviously, I want to just a uh, special thanks and shout out to the, the Milwaukee Rep for hosting um, this gathering. And Mark and Chad for your leadership. And congratulations on your 65th anniversary. And um, the Intersections Planning Committee, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, I, I know some of you all, so how gracious of you. Um, I just hope I'll be worthy. Um, and then, um, <laughs> Courtney and Kat, let me, where's Kat? Is Kat here? Oh, Kat, who was so sweet and picked me up from the airport, and Courtney, who's been just so gracious. You know, um, I think at the core of community engagement is just making friends, you know, knowing how to make friends, and you two do that really well. I'm glad to have you as uh, two new friends. So gracious, so welcoming. Thank you both very much. Okay, yeah. So folks, listen, we could be having any conversation, I mean, given uh, what's going on in the world, um, certainly what's happening in our nation, we could be having any conversation in the world, and here we are, huddled together, having this conversation here uh, in this city right now. So um, how important and special that is. Um, I'd like to do something before I get into uh, giving you a little uh, bit of an overview of what I'm hoping to do today. I would first like to find out um, if Courtney was nice enough to give me a, um, a list of the attendees, but I never look at that because I always want to just show up and be surprised. You know, like, oh, I didn't know you were going to come. I didn't know you were going to be here. So I don't know exactly who's here. I know a lot of you probably know each other. But could we just um, take a moment to introduce ourselves to the people to your right and to your left? And wait, wait, listen, don't leave me yet. Um, <laughs> Introduce yourself to the people to your right and to the left and behind you, directly behind you and directly in front of you so that you are creating a circumference around you of people that you know and then you'll at least know somebody who knows so, know somebody else who knows somebody else, right? Um, could we just do that? And here's what I'd like you to do when I say go. Could you just give them your full name if you feel comfortable? And then I would also like to invite you to share with them the pronouns that you use. And so it might sound something like this. Hi, my name's Carmen Morgan, and I use she, her, hers as pronouns, right? And I see some of you are like, oh, what, do I, what, would, what does that mean? It's okay, you'll be fine. So I'm gonna say go, one, two, three, go, and then uh, do it, and then everybody uh, get to know the people around you. So one, two, three, go. Okay, uh, you can finish up that last introduction. Did you get to everybody? Oh, I see folks still in deep conversation. Oh, that's good. Oh, wow, he's got a lot to say. He's really into this. All right, okay, folks, wonderful. Uh, did you get to most of the folks around you? 
Uh, are you, if you're sitting next to people that you know already, this might not have been as exciting for you, but <laughs> did a lot of you get to meet the folks around you? Yes. Oh, good, oh, good, most of you. Okay, wonderful. I want to take this a little further, if you don't mind, just so that we can kind of get a sense of the landscape who's here. Um, if you wouldn't mind signifying in some way, and you know, you can choose to wave your hand or clap or snap or shout um, if you want to stomp your feet or if you want to stand up, whatever works for you, but just signify in some way if the following um, uh, speaks to you. So if you're from the West Coast, yes. <laughs> okay. Not that, not that much of us here, okay. <laughs> No problem. East Coast? Okay. Uh, what about if you're from the South? Okay. Uh, if you are from the Midwest? Oh. Well, of course. Um, what about if you're from a state that, is, that has experienced a storm within the last three months? I don't, I did tell you, I'm from I'm from the West Coast. I'm from Southern California. I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, what about if you're here from Alaska or Hawaii? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, what about if you're from a recognized or an unrecognized tribe? Yes. Thank you. Uh, what if you're here from outside the U.S.? Wonderful. Oh, that's great. Okay. Um, how many of you have seen Black Panther? Okay. How many of you have seen Black Panther at least three times? Okay. Um, and of course, if you're here from Milwaukee. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. And if you're here from Milwaukee Rep. Wonderful. Okay, folks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so listen, before I get started, you know, I appreciate John um, um, talking about the fact that we are um, on land that does not, that was taken from the original people here. And I want to continue that. I just want to do, um, before we get into talking a little bit more about um, community engagement, I'd like to just pause and uh, double down on what uh, John said. Um, and I'd like to... Uh, just take a moment to acknowledge that pretty much anywhere that we go in the United States, we are on land that was taken from the original people that were here and those people that are still here. And when we don't acknowledge that, it does a disservice and perpetuates a myth and I'm reminded by the brilliant activist artist, Larissa Fasshorse, who said uh, to me, don't come in my house, lock me up in my own basement, and then ask me how you can help me. So at least we can acknowledge the ground on which we gather. We will not be able to effectively build communities, engage with communities on top of lies. So, I'd like to um, continue what John started and acknowledge the present day tribes here of Wisconsin, the Ojibwe, the Stockbridge Munsee, the Oneida, the Menomini, the Ho-Chunk, the, the Potawatomi, and we also acknowledge their ancestors who came from the greater New England area, the Montauk, the Pequot, the Mohican, the Mohican, and the Lenny Lenape, and also those who we do not know as a result of their genocide. Uh, and yeah, uh, the word Milwaukee um, means good, beautiful and pleasant land, and that is the land that we are on. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think that's important. I think that that is uh, important to do um, so that we don't forget the history and that we don't forget that um, 
to forget that history is to relegate um, the uh, uh, current experience of indigenous folks, Native American folks, uh, to relegate it to uh, mascots, costumes, artifacts, and museums, and it supports uh, the ongoing project of colonialism. So, um, thank you. So I wanted to share with you what I was thinking about doing, and quite frankly, um, Courtney kind of told me what to do, much like she told John what to do. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, she's, she's a mover, <laughs> she's a shaker, she's doing it all. This is what I was thinking, uh, informed by Courtney, um, <laughs> that I would share with you some of my thinking around community engagement, community building, um, and then I, this is my own, I added this myself, Courtney didn't tell me to. I wanted to add a little tool that I use a lesson um, that I've learned along the way, that I've gathered along the way, and the work that I've done. I want to share that tool with you uh, towards the back end, and then I'm hoping that we'll have time for questions so that we can have a discussion. I think I realize that this is moving. I thought that I was, so in a minute, I'll just be closer to you all. Okay, so let me, okay. I just got to get everything situated now that I know that it moves. So, um, so that's what I was thinking. I want to talk to you a little bit about some thoughts that I have. I, some, you know, I was told that I could provoke you all. So Courtney said I could provoke you. I'm going to be doing a little bit of that. And then a tool. Um, and then I hope that we'll have time for some questions and answers and a really good uh, hearty discussion right before dinner. And then uh, we come back here and we get to see an incredible performance. I can't wait to see that. Um, so. Uh, that's what I want, to I want to try to do. So let me start off with, um, first of all, does that sound like a plan to you? Because Courtney is suggesting it, but I want to, okay. <laughs> We're all, you're, you're in this with me. Okay, good. Don't leave me out here. Don't leave me hanging out here by myself. Um, so here's what I want to talk. I want to, I want to start off with uh, something I've been thinking about, and I know a lot of you have been thinking about, in fact, you're gathered here for the next couple of days to talk about community engagement. Uh, so here's what I've been thinking about. Actually, do we really need community engagement? I mean, well, I guess part of it that I'm wrestling with is, um, what do we mean by community? And then what do we mean by engagement? Um, I'd like to start there. Uh, I want to know, which community is doing the engaging? Who are you all engaging? Who's being engaged? How are we defining community? What's all of this about? Because I think that for some communities, um, engagement has led to their genocide. Engagement has led to their enslavement, internment, loss of sovereignty, loss of land. So if you're from one of those communities where that's your history, when you hear community engagement, uh, you're going to be a little suspicious. Uh, I mean, at best, community engagement is transactional. So that's what I want to know. I want to know how are we defining it? What do you all mean by community engagement? And this is not uh, rhetorical. I actually am asking, what, do you all, what are you all talking about? What do you mean by community engagement? And I think there's a mic that can roam around, but I'd love to just at least get some thoughts so that I'm not up here you know, by myself wondering what, what are you all thinking about in, when you say community engagement? Partnership. Okay, partnership. Just the idea of collective impact, that if we are working together to serve a group of people, we can do a better job if we're all doing it in, in, with one idea, with one driving force. Okay, collective impact. Some, what was that? Vis visibility. visibility is part of community engagement. Whose visibility? The theater's visibility or the community's visibility? The community's visibility, okay. Anybody else? Reciprocity, Reciprocity? okay. So it's a both and, okay. Anybody else? Intentionality. Intentionality, okay. Yes. Okay, listening to the community stories. A couple more. Uh, I hear building empathy, and then I heard relationship. Okay, so it's relational. Access. Who's access? Everybody's access? Anybody's access? Okay. Education. Education. Okay. Okay. Um, any other last minute ones? Because I want to posit something else. 
Okay. Well, here's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering if it's not so much about community engagement that we need. I'm wondering if it's more like uh, community justice. Because uh, I feel, I mean, I'm, you know, folks, you invited me to come here, you know what my background is. So, because I feel um, that we can't really have community, let alone engagement, unless all of us are seen and treated as fully human. So I think all roads just keep leading back to justice. I'm just wondering for you all, and this really is uh, respectfully, I'm, I'm just inquiring why this isn't being framed as a community justice conversation as opposed to a community engagement conversation. Or do we feel that they're the same thing? Is, does community engagement mean community justice? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm hearing folks say that, that, that it's not the same thing, and I would agree. And I would say to you that if I'm on the parameters, if I'm on the outside of this conversation, if I am the unrepresented, I'm not sure that I would want to engage with the people in this room. Um, I'm not sure uh, where, quite frankly, you all are coming from in terms of community engagement. Um, and, but on the other hand, if I'm on the outside, if I am on the perimeters, if I am the unrepresented, and I know that you're committed to community justice, well, then that might be a different conversation, and I might show up very differently. Yeah, I'm, I'm just speaking what, you know, my, my truth. Um, and I would say, folks, I don't think that it's semantics. I mean, I, I, we already, somebody already said that they would, they would position them as two different things. I don't think that it's just semantics. Uh, community engagement versus community justice. I think it's an issue of values. Um, if I were on the outside listening to this conversation, I would want to know if you all are talking about a grant deliverable or if you're talking about core values. Um, I would need to know that before I could be interested in a community engagement process with you or project with you. If I don't know you, really, if I don't know you, and you position yourself as a cultural arts institution, as a theater, I might have some reason to not trust you. Um, I would want to know just basic things like, look, uh, you're talking about community engagement. Can my community use your space for community meeting? Uh, you're talking about community engagement. Do you have all gender restrooms? You're talking about community engagement, but what language would I have to speak in here in order to be heard? I want to know if you understand what keeps me up at night, what keeps my community up at night. Do you understand how my community is racially profiled? Do you understand that your theater is on my ancestral land? Will your theater be a sanctuary for my community to be safe from deportation if we need a safe harbor? These are the things I need to know before you come and try to engage with me. Are you going to stand between me and the police if it comes to that? Just exactly what kind of community engagement are you talking about? We, uh, with the art equity uh, training that we do, uh, we use a documentary. Some of you in this room have gone through that facilitator training. Uh, we do a documentary that features eight men discussing race in the United States. And towards the end of the documentary, one of the men, David Lee, who identifies as a Chinese-American man, he looks directly in the camera and he says, if I were talking to a room full of white people, I would say to them, give me justice. Because if you do not give me justice, I cannot love you. So folks, this justice thing is a big deal. Um, there are few things that people are willing to die for, and justice is one of them. I'm not saying that you know, folks in this room need, need to be um, willing to die for justice, but I, I am saying that um, it's a prevailing primary um, uh, factor in people's hearts and minds. And if you're thinking about engaging communities, um, I would try to center um, justice uh, at the core of that work. Uh, we work uh, with art equity. We work with theaters all over the nation, and we talk to them about uh, what we call a politic of difference. Have, what are their politics? What are their politics around difference? Uh, how do they engage the other, uh, capital O? Uh, how do they create the other? How do they invoke the other? Uh, we ask them, uh, when you uh, see the other, what is 
operating for you? What is the uh, operating system that sometimes is really subliminal, that sometimes is unconscious? So we talk to them about their politics of difference, and we talk to them about um, everything from, well, I don't see difference, we're all human beings. Uh, uh, that approach, that's one approach. Um, and then we also talk to them about uh, the other approach, the uh, diversity approach, which relies on optics, and uh, number counting and um, tokenizing uh, without any commitment to substantial systemic structural change. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sharing this because these different approaches to difference, we suggest that what is required is an approach to difference that acknowledge, acknowledges history, current privilege and power dynamics, and that works towards justice. Um, and we call that the social justice approach to difference. Um, so we share that with theaters because we believe that theater's role is not only to be a tool for social change, and I know some of you don't necessarily feel that, te that theater's role is to be primarily and fundamentally a tool for social change. Maybe that's a byproduct, um, but theater's role might be fundamentally um, to um, maybe to entertain. Uh, maybe theater's role is to um, be a mirror to hold up uh, different narratives. But some of us feel that theater's fundamental role is actually to be a tool for social change. Um, I'm one of those people. Uh, and that until we actually have equity in this country, um, that everyone is seen as fully human, that we would go further than that and say, not only should theater's role be a tool for social change, all theaters should be social justice institutions. That doing social justice theater and upholding social justice values would be the role of theater. Until we have equity for everyone, parity for everyone, justice for everyone, what else should you be doing? You should be doing social justice theater. Uh, and the fact that we have, um, uh, well, that we don't have um, everyone being seen as fully human, uh, actually, it's not just theaters that should be social justice institutions. Pretty much everybody should be social justice institutions. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, you mean, should the bank be a social? Yes, the bank should be a social justice bank. <laughs> credit union, yeah, should be a social justice credit union. What about the grocery store? Grocery store should be a social justice grocery store. Gas station, yes, the gas station. What about the schools? Yes, the schools. Um, there's a, is Joya Headley here? I know there's a young high school student who's actually doing um, racial justice work in Milwaukee high schools. I hope she's gonna be here maybe over the next couple of days. Um, but anyway, the students are protesting uh, racial disparity in the high schools. So yes, the schools should be social justice institutions. Until we have justice, every institution should prioritize social justice values. Um, so it might, it, might, it might sound like I'm asking you all to shift your frame from community engagement to community, to community justice. Yes, <laughs> that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to make sure that the work that you're doing around community engagement is not transactional, that you're not inviting people into your spaces, trying to connect to them, to the things that you are doing, but instead centering them and their lives and their needs and their issues at the core. I'm asking you to not invite them to center and sit around and talk about your plays but to share power with them, access and resource. I'm asking you to acknowledge that as predominantly white institutions, you've had access to a whole lot of resources and possibly you might have a debt to pay and that the responsibility should be maybe to move back a little bit or even give back and to be a part of something as opposed to being the only game in town. I would be invested, if I were a theater that was committed to social justice issues, I would be invested, particularly in the current moment right now uh, in the American theater um, around leadership change. By the way, have you all been tracking that uh, document that Rebecca, um, it's Rebecca and Evren, right, that they have, that is incredible. I mean, it's one thing to know it theoretically, but to see that graph in that chart. And if you don't have access to that, we all should be clicking on that link and staying abreast of what's happening. If you don't have access to that link, 
How can they get access to that link? Can people who would like that link to see, do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, what's that? Oh, thank you. It's going to be shared on Slack. And you all know what that is? Okay. Okay, it's gonna be shared so that you all will have access to that. Um, so part of your investment, your community engagement investment, I think is definitely just outside of a regional context. I think it's uh, connected to field building. Um, obviously, it's connected to the lives of real people. So how will you know if this summit is more than lip service and that you won't be having the same exact conversation in 12 months? I, I wanna know, how, how are y'all gonna know? No, really, I wanna know. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm hoping that it's gonna mean that you all are gonna be interrogating systemic and structural issues. Uh, I'm hoping that you all are gonna be thinking about uprooting some stuff, disrupting some stuff, changing some stuff. Um, or, I suppose you could be talking about community engagement for another decade. But, you know, I say this often, and it's gonna sound very reductive, but I say, you know, in order to change, you actually have to change. Um, <laughs> I say to you know, institutions and theaters, um, uh, I have so many stories, I shouldn't go off tangent here, but I just gotta tell you this one story. So I'm working with a theater. They would like to diversify their board. It's an all white board. They're in a very large, diverse metropolitan community. And um, so they called me and said, listen, could you come and talk to us about diversifying our board? And you know, I flew down and uh, talked to them. Now I just call. I mean, now I just t have the conversation over the phone instead of flying down because there's some helpful strategic questions to ask. So they want to diversify their board. And so the first thing I said to them was, well, what kind of diversity are you talking about? Because folks, you know that when we talk about diversity now, really it's code for we want people of color. And I think that's problematic because it's scapegoats. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons that are wrong with that. Like we shouldn't be pitting issue against issue. Um, it, so anyway, so I said, well, what kind of diversity are you talking about? And they said, um, well, people of color, of course. We want more people of color on the board. So I said, well, talk to me about your anti-racist ideology. You want more people of color on the board. What's, what's your anti-racist ideology? Well, we don't have any anti-racist ideology. What are you talking about? We just want more people of color on the board. <laughs> I said, well, you're gonna have to change your culture if you wanna get them and keep them. And I, then I said, and this is why now I just talk to people on the phone because I don't think this was, the, this next thing that I said was very upsetting to them, very off-putting to them. I said, um, I think you should just be an all-white board. Just stay an all-white board and just become an all-white anti-racist board. And then worrying about people of color on the board is gonna be, you won't have to worry about people of color on your board. I mean, something happens, it's, I don't know, coincidence maybe, whenever people are anti-racist, organizations are anti-racist, people of color don't mind being there, and they stay, and they're invested. So I said, why don't you focus on that first? Um, now I just talk to them over the phone first. So, but that's what I mean, folks. In order to change, you actually have to change. So, what do you think about this community justice instead of community engagement? What do you think about that? Are you gonna, okay, okay. Well, I see, I see five people willing to, <laughs> I see at least five or six people willing to move in that direction. Um, okay, so now I wanna share with you the tool, because I wanna be mindful of time. I would love for us to have a conversation. Am I doing okay, Courtney? Yeah? Okay, wonderful. I've got enough time. I wanna share the tool and then uh, we're gonna open it up for Q&A so we can have a great conversation. So here's the tool. I have been thinking about this because I really believe, I think all of us here, uh, everybody in this room, we're very committed, we're very invested in building this beloved community, right? It, does, it can happen and in fact I've seen glimpses of it. Uh, and I've been thinking about it. How do you do that? How do you build a beloved community? What does it look like? Um, how do you change the hearts and minds of um, a community, uh, of a nation, of an organization? What does it look like? How do you operationalize that? And I think it looks like this. And this comes from a lot of work. You know, I used to do a lot of community organizing. Um, I was a community organizer in Northwest Pasadena. I used to do tenants' rights organizing with um, African Americans and Latinos. 
And I remember being frustrated time and time again when um, these two communities would be going after the same things, but somehow being pitted against each other. Uh, I, I remember, um, you know, the Latino community was working to get a day laborer center, and the African American community was working uh, to get a hiring hall, and they fought. They fought at each other. And I remember thinking, I think you both want the same thing. So there's something about having a shared analysis. So this is, to me, the first thing that is needed. Uh, if we want to change the world, I think, and this is my um, uh, my um, probably faulty um, uh, uh, hypothesis. I'm testing it. I'm always testing this out. I think the first and the first thing that is needed, first and foremost, is uh, having folks with some shared analysis, uh, some shared common understanding, some clarity in terms of how we are making meaning of the world. Uh, we're getting all this data. Uh, you're calling it a coincidence. I'm calling it racism. Uh, how are we making meaning of the things that we see around us, the patterns that we see around us? That's what I mean by an analysis. I mean, obviously, you know, some awareness, like you have to be able to look around and say, something's happening here. And then you've got to be able to make meaning of the thing that's happening. So I think that's the first piece, uh, some awareness and some analysis. And then the second is you've got to be willing to take action. Now, I think that they should be in that order. Um, <laughs> I work with folks, I'm laughing because I, I think, I, I'm thinking of all these failed projects and all of these things that I would call officially a, this is a sociological term, officially a hot mess <laughs> because <laughs> folks were galloping ahead with the very best of intentions, no analysis. So we have all kinds of interesting projects that are created. Um, and they're not hitting the mark. So I think first and foremost, have some awareness. Um, sometimes it means that you're gonna have to do some self-educating. Uh, look at these patterns, health disparities, housing, um, uh, um, uh, lack of um, job opportunities. These are not coincidences when they continue to fall down along gender and racial lines. So the analysis, the awareness, and then you've got to be willing to take action. Because the other thing I see is folks who have a whole lot of analysis, they got a whole lot of stuff to say, and um, they're doing nothing. Uh, and I, I do think that the action is going to be more than Facebook and you know putting a happy face on something that somebody says. I think it's going to actually require sometimes some heavy lifting, doing things, moving your body, getting outside, maybe being uncomfortable, uh, speaking. Uh, asking questions over and over again. It might be direct action. Uh, so those two things. And then second, uh, and I feel like this part is key, uh, there's got to be some accountability loop uh, that if these things are going awry, then um, check it, course adjust, pivot for goodness sakes. I mean, don't commit to the end to a bad idea uh, and figure out some way to have a feedback loop where folks can tell you what's going on in a way that's not punitive. So a high commitment to feedback. And then will you listen to people when they give you the feedback? And then respond to it, believe them. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, and I think sometimes this one is the hardest, um, is to um, have some uh, grace. You know, I think, um, uh, I say often, you know, I, I wonder if my humanity can show today. You know, like, oh, my humanity is hanging out. Um, I think that it's very easy to be right. Um, and some of us can be self-righteous in a hot minute. And uh, we can be by ourselves. I mean, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to build community? Um, are we trying to work um, together? You know, it's very hard to do this work when you're siloed and when you're isolated and when you're just way out there. On, you, and you can be right. You can stand on principle and be right and self-righteous and not do a damn thing because nobody can uh, work with you. So I think all four of those things are needed. And I don't think that all four are needed all the time in equal measure. I think sometimes it's got to be all about accountability. Just drill down on accountability. Um, or sometimes I think it's time for action. So I think you're, you know, you're just going to have to, just like you're driving a stick shift, know when to uh, put it, put, press the gas and l pull up on the clutch. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. Uh, those are the four ingredients for 
how to change the world, how to operationalize the values for justice. Um, and you just have to be steadfast, steadfast, steadfast. Um, yeah, so that's my two cents. That's my tool, Courtney. I added that without, um, I didn't think you would mind. Uh, after I provoked people with a question, I added that as a, a, a tool that I think might be helpful. So folks, um, I wanna close out uh, with sharing something. I shared this recently with um, an incredible uh, group of students uh, who are um, brilliant and creative and uh, much like the, a lot of the people in this room. Um, I wanted to share this with you because I, I really think this is true. Um, I do believe that right here, right in this room, are some of the most powerful, powerful people in the world. Uh, we happen to be sitting in um, the United States, uh, which is one of the most powerful countries in the world, and you all are the folks who create culture. You actually make culture. You add culture to um, this, uh, to, to, to our, to, to our, um, to the ethos, you all are adding and creating culture. You're deciding who is going to be seen as fully human. You're deciding who is going to be seen. Um, and I think that because of that, you all can absolutely positively do anything. I think that um, the uh, evil forces, um, and I won't name any names, uh, I don't think that they're as smart as we are. I don't think that they're as creative as we are. Um, and I think that it's gonna be incumbent upon uh, you all to actually change the world, yeah. So here's what I wanna leave off with. I'm gonna just do a quote here from Tony K. Bambara who says that it is the role of the artist to make the revolution irresistible. Um, and we know what's at stake. We know what, what we have to lose. Um, and so, yeah, um, on behalf of my colleagues who aren't here with me physically, but I know they're here with me in spirit, Ty Defoe, Hannah Fenlon, Olivia Garcia, Leslie Ishii, Hana Koroyama, Libby Peterson, Nigel Porter, and Michael Robertson. I want to thank you all for listening. Okay, and I'm hoping we can have a conversation. Wonderful. So we still have a little bit of time, and this is where the Q&A would come in. Um, I think we have about 20 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, we've got about 30 minutes. Can we please have a conversation? Uh, and I, it's my understanding that there is a... Um, we can use this mic too. There is a, a microphone that's available. So let's, let's have a discussion. I'm gonna come down over here with this mic so I can share it with folks. Okay, so let's have a discussion I'm hoping. Sorry, sorry about that. I like microphones. Um, so Carmen, one of the things that I struggle with in my work and that I've actually, working in predominantly white institutions, um, this idea that, that engagement, engagement with audiences, engagement with communities is actually education. That at its core, like in, I've heard people say actually engagement is education. And I was wondering if you could speak on that, like how, how that, it, is that hel a helpful framework and how that is problematic? Um. Yeah, um, and I would love other folks to speak on it too. I think it's a missed opportunity. I think it's limited. Well, you just heard what I said. I feel like it should be about community justice. So um, if that's the limitation, I mean, if that's the, if that's the, uh, the framework that it's about educating, um, I feel like, wow, what a missed opportunity. And who, who's being educated? Yes. So I'll, I'll try to go loud. <laughs> um, and I, I was afraid to speak when you asked us the question about uh, community engagement and what does it mean. And I think you just made it a little uncomfortable when we were, uh, because the two words I would have said were truth-telling and some form of reparation. Because we listen we're not very good at it. I'm from <coughs> Minneapolis. And um, we, when, to, when we're batting about zero with any follow through on any of the toilet freebies, so what is our action step as a theater institution, as theater workers? We can say, yes, we are on this stolen land, but it's got to go in the, it's, it's got to be truth telling and action. So I just wanted to throw that out there. 
Yeah, no, you would, you would get no disagreement from me. And I think that it just has to take on the very unique form and specificity of the issue at hand, right? So um, bring a strong analysis to bear. What is the plan for action? And you know, there are 355 million ways to do this, and we just have to have lots of different points of entry. And I think the other thing that we, that we um, uh, miss often, particularly because we're always needing to respond and to react so quickly, is um, our strategery. You know, I feel like we're gonna have to link up, share information, be strategic. Uh, I think that that continues to be uh, challenging and daunting. I, I see it, you know, and I see uh, working specifically with a sector in a field and really trying to deploy a strategic ap approach to, to this work and, you know, with the very best of intentions still, um, there's just so much to be done. But I would agree with you. I would agree with you. That's what it starts to look like. That level of specificity. Uh, there's one, two, three hands, so we just need help with uh, getting mics to them. Thanks. If I heard you correctly, you said you started your career as an organizer with tenants. Um, and I'd love to hear a sentence or two about how your thinking has evolved throughout your career to where you are today. I don't know if that's the very best use of our time. Uh, I mean, I, not, I don't mean any disrespect, but I feel like uh, we, can, we can talk about some broader issues here. Uh, how largely, I would say, th th well, the short answer in terms of how my uh, thinking might have evolved is doing the direct on the ground work with communities, I kept finding that that missing ingredient was having a shared framework and this shared analysis so that we would be working across purposes and almost sometimes being pitted against each other and working against each other. And I that frustrated me to no end. So, uh, that's, that's, I think that that would be what evolved out of doing that work on the ground, was to say, you know what, we need to just, we need an activist building factory here, where we have a shared language, shared analysis, and we can work like the Avengers and, 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 and be strategic, you know, to, what, you know what, uh, what I enjoy, I enjoy going to um, a conference and there are folks who have been a part of some conversations and they have shared language and they are strategically placed in rooms and spaces to handle what needs to be handled at, in, in, that, in that conversation. That's what I think. I think we have a lot of potential, a lot of opportunities um, to build a base of folks where this is just common sense for them, you know, where we don't have to like struggle to find people to understand what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, that's that's to me. I guess I would say what 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 uh, what evolved. And I didn't mean to be dismissive, but I just felt like, oh, I just want to make sure that we're yeah. Yeah. Thank you, very much. Thank you. <coughs> there was two and three. Do you remember where they are? Yeah. I guess I, guess I have a mic. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I work with a particular population, uh, adults with autism. And recently, I've been told both in the arts and outside of it uh, that uh, many people are excited because they see that as the next front in EDI. How do we make ourselves allies in the current front? Because if we wait for the other things to be fixed before we are the next front, I don't think I'll be alive for that. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I don't know about that. Uh, I, I think that one of the things that we need to, I would support us in doing a better job of doing is just what you named, which is that I don't, I think we, we do need to take an intersectional approach and we need to try to figure out ways to have these conversations so it doesn't sound like, um, well, you know, we gotta do this first and then we're gonna do that and then we're gonna do this. Uh, you know, I quote Loretta Ross often who says, you know, I wasn't first born black, then born a woman, then born poor. You know, I was born all three of these things simultaneously. And I think, you know, I wanna know um, if we're gonna address racism, if we're gonna address classism, how are we doing it for folks um, who um, are autistic? I mean, how does uh, all of these things have to come to bear in how, people, how people's uh, lived experiences show up? Uh, we've gotta actually figure out strategies 
to have these conversations in the, in the complicated ways that we experience them in our lives. So, yeah. And what does that look like? Well, I think it looks like us getting more facility and more experience in taking on intersectional approaches. So it looks like everywhere you go, you know, what I, I'm staying at the uh, Hudson. Is any, by the way, does anybody know how to, okay, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> I wa anybody who's staying at the Hudson, talk to me after this, because I want to figure out what's going on with that shower. Um, <laughs> it, I think what it looks like is, we're, I think that it looks like us having, cultivating this, um, I call it the operating software that's just always in the background, like the matrix, you know, like, and then once you see, you can't unsee. I think that it's bringing to bear that analysis that um, gender lens, the racial lens, the class lens, um, certainly I think around issues of uh, disability. Um, I think that you bring that to bear. So you show up, and I do this all the time when I go somewhere now, I'm like, well, where are the all gender restrooms? I need an all gender, you know, it's, it's a part of my, my body needs it now. I need an all gender restroom. Like it, it feels odd to me to see um, gender specific restrooms. Um, and I also say, and I said this when I went to the Hudson, immediately I, wa I walked in and I said, well, where would my wheelchair go? You know, like I have this wheelchair with me. I'm always with, the, I have a wheelchair and I just need to figure out where would I go if I had my wheel, where is, I, I mean, I have a, I have a, um, a, a wheelchair accessibility um, frame that is just always running in the background. And it's not just, um, uh, a, a, about having access to a wheelchair, but I'm saying that it's a muscle that we all have to um, increase so that we're walking with all of these different lenses, these valences with us all the time and bringing them to bear. I think it, it starts to look like that so that we would never then uh, be in a room and say, um, I don't know if we've got time for that issue, we're gonna focus on this, this issue now. But I also think, and I would also say this really, that it's also okay for us to say, we need to spend time right now with women of color having a conversation about what women of color need to have a conversation about. I, and I, I think that they are both and experiences. Um, and I'm fearful because I sometimes hear people using intersectionality now as a weapon, you know, like, well, wait a minute, we can't have that conversation at all right now because you're not having all the others. No, I think that we're gonna bring an analysis to bear that's more complicated. We can lead with the conversation about race and gender and bring in all of these other lenses. So I think I went a little bit off on a tangent, but I would agree with you. We can't pit the issues against um, one another because they live and reside in human beings that experience them simultaneously. So I would agree with you. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I was asked a couple years ago to change the department title um, that I was working under from community outreach to community engagement, and I was instantly uncomfortable with it because it just seemed like it was a trendy thing to do um, that didn't fit what we were doing, and I wasn't really sure why or how to vocalize that um, because outreach is a term I'm comfortable with that felt like what we were doing, you know, all the things everyone said, like collaboration, partnership, education. Um, engagement does mean something different and you nailed a lot of things that um, have given me a lot to think about. And I, I just, you know, I kind of, a, I appreciate what you said. Is this a grant deliverable or a core value? And I don't think it is our job necessarily as an arts organization to serve everyone just because that's mm -hmm. coming from, you know, either a grant or this desire, you know, I I feel like I'm gonna out myself, but oh well. I would say this in front of my board and my organization that yes, there's problems going on in Sherman Park. Should I go down there and try to solve them with the programs that I have that aren't gonna solve them and we're not wanted there? No. You know, like I need to be working on pr programs that are going to, um, give people a voice, give people a way to see themselves, give people some empowerment um, through things that, that we're comfortable doing. And I don't know, I just feel like there's this huge movement to like, we've gotta be everyone to everything and we can't. Like that's 
ridiculous and people don't want it. But I don't know, I'm kind of just babbling on the mic, but I appreciate the things you said because it's given me a lot of uh, things to think about and go back and say, what exactly are we doing? What's the directive? Where is it coming from? And if it's just to check off a box that we're there, that's ridiculous because that's transparent and people are going to know that. Absolutely. I agree with you. I think that there's a middle ground. I think you're right. You can't be all things to all people. Uh, and I don't think that folks uh, want the institutions to do that. I think that we can kind of sense that when we're being used and when you are, um, when we're being tokenized and when this is a grant deliverable. Um, and quite frankly, sometimes people just say that. They're like, whoa, this is a grant deliverable. We got to get it done. So I would agree. I don't think that you can, you can be all things to all folks. Uh, but I, th I do think that there's a middle ground. And here's the piece that for me gets frustrating is I feel, and I, you know, I am so not wanting to offend anybody in here, but I just want to say I, I do feel that some of these predominantly white institutions, and you know, some of you all are from predominantly white institutions, um, function like gangs. I mean, you all are some serious, you all run that stuff. You know what I mean? And it's not accessible. So I feel that the in-between for me is you don't have to be all things to all people, but for goodness sakes, I think you should be accessible. You know, I think that um, what I would like to, know, I, I, I respect an organization that says, look, this is our very specific emphasis and focus. We've got this, but that then, you know, doesn't shut me out when I want to learn and have access to, I mean, you know, these are institutions that are supposed to be for the good of the community. And some of them, I do feel folks run it like their own sorority and fr fraternities. You have to know the code, you got to know who, and this one's got a special seat and such and such. I, and listen, I, do, I don't know enough about um, Milwaukee Rep, so I sure, listen, I'm not, I hope I'm not offending anybody. I hope I'm not offending my host, the people that invited me to be here. But you know what I'm saying? I think that, um, I think that's the thing that concerns me, is you don't have to be all things to all people. I agree. But for goodness sakes, it would be good for you to be open, accessible, transparent, accountable, say that you have this specific um, lens and approach. Um, and I don't know, you don't get to just have this all to yourselves, people. You just don't, especially right now in this day and age when we are looking for leadership, we're desperate for leadership. Uh, the arts, these arts institutions, uh, you've got to, in some instances, we're counting on you to fill that breach. Step up, step out, move up, move out. And um, yeah, you don't get to uh, keep it to yourselves and have it for yourselves and run it like your own little private gang. That's my thinking, yeah. Okay, okay. I, I thought, uh, I know ooh. that there was a hand over here that somebody- I have yeah. a mic. Oh good, good, the mics <laughs> are getting around. I'm gonna get some more water. Um, I'm interested in um, you explaining a little bit more what grace looks like in your tool and why you put it at number four, if it's really at number four, if it, or if it's actually throughout, but you just named it for us? Yes, it's actually throughout. I don't think it's number four. What I should have said is, you know, all four of these things don't necessarily operate in order. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, just like you're riding a, you're, you're driving a, a stick, uh, you gotta press more gas at one time and then ease up on the clutch. I think that they're ingredients and uh, sometimes it's all about grace. Sometimes it's all about grace. But I feel that, you know, I also wouldn't want that to be used as an excuse. Um, it's got to be, you know, there's got to be accountability too. So, no, the order isn't necessarily, we could, grace could be one. Uh, I would say this though. I think that it's helpful to have an analysis either first or in tandem with the work that you do, because I've just seen so many missteps. Uh, and even when you're working to have an analysis, then we, you know, then the question is, well, for goodness sakes, what analysis does that person have? I mean, there's just so much work to do, you know what I mean? So I would say that would be the only one that if you asked me, uh, is there an order to it? I would say, yeah, uh, I know there's a lot to be done and we can do a lot and continue to do as much as possible and keep strengthening your analysis. And uh, uh, for me, some of the biggest mistakes that I've seen in um, national programs, educational programs, are well-intended and they are officially hot messes. So I think that that's, that's why I say that. But yeah, no, grace, we, should, we could lead with grace, grace all the time, uh, grace, more grace. I think that we 
it, like you heard me say, it's very easy to, um, and I understand when you do this work, when you all are in the communities, when you all are um, trying to hold uh, folks accountable and speak truth to power, um, it's easy to really uh, stand on principle so hard sometimes that, uh, you know, you're by yourself. You're right and you're by yourself. So that's what I mean by the grace piece. Hi. Um, I um, had a question uh, about what kind of advice you could give to the people of color in the room. Um, for me, uh, my understanding of intersectionality is connected to a deeper understanding that oppression is interconnected and whether we are uh, people of color, gay, queer, uh, differently abled, um, gender non-conforming, our experiences of these intersectionalities are emotional and related to pain and suffer and not necessarily an opportunity. So when we come to this crossroads of intersectional conversations, how can the people of color in this room walk to this road uh, to feel like they will meet the counterpart at this crossroad that we're being provided this week? And how uh, can we, uh, I guess, uh, have these conversations so that they are not a car crash, but a meeting? What's your advice? I guess that's my question. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was just going to say, well, I don't give advice, but I, I want to say, I want to share something about my experience. I could do that. Um, and I feel, I feel you. Uh, I feel you because I think that every time we have these conversations, uh, particularly people of color, uh, folks who are experiencing the thing, um, as we're talking about the thing, we're experiencing the thing and we're being re-injured, uh, particularly folks who are pushed to the margins in our lived experiences, we show up for these conversations with people who have very good intentions and then we get re-injured and re-injured and their microaggressions jumping off all over the place. Uh, I guess what I would say is that first and foremost, and I used to not always say this, and I say it now because of my own lived experience and the experiences of others, I think that it is important to prioritize self-care. And I know when we have these conversations, we try to do them in such a way that um, we don't, uh, that the uh, people of color um, or the uh, non-binary folks or the folks who are the most um, targeted um, uh, aren't used. They're not used in those conversations um, uh, to service and to educate the folks with the most uh, privilege and the folks uh, with the most entitlement to comfort and all of what that takes. So I know that there are ways to set up containers for those conversations that don't privilege the people with the most power in the room or the most privilege in the room, that uh, their comfort just doesn't get to dictate everything. I think that's one thing, you know, if you can go into it with those kind of ground rules, those kind of group agreements, and your, your own self-care is gonna be really important. One of the things that I do, that we, you know, we uh, started to do, um, and back when we started to do it, I think there was some a tiny, maybe a little bit of controversy that year in San Diego with those affinity groups. Um, but I think that there is something helpful about having that affinity space. Um, for people with an acute outsider experience, that affinity space allows you to breathe. And you do have to do it in some interesting ways where you, because you know, we're not gonna be able to compartmentalize our, our identities, but you show up to the, the POC space and you have a conversation about uh, the intersection of gender and sexual identity in that space, but they, that, there, that it is okay to have those affinity conversations um, in complicated kind of matrices, you know? Um, I think that is helpful. Uh, the other thing that I think is really helpful because race is such a marker and it is, so pernicious and so it shows up in every single aspect of these conversations. Everyone, right? Every aspect of identity. There's race, just add race to it. You know, disability and race, class and race, age and race, all of them, race is huge. And so expect to 
contend with that in every single solitary conversation. And I think because of it, what is most helpful is to have um, at the ready a nice little group of white anti-racists and deploy them strategically. <laughs> That's, you know, I, I used to for a long time, uh, particularly when I was really, really angry in my um, early 20s doing uh, anti-racist work, I used to say, it is not my job to educate white people. I'm not gonna be educating white people. No, no, no. And now what do I do? <laughs> I work with a whole bunch of white people. We educate, and we're trying to educate white people to be anti-racist a whole little bit. So I, I do think that that is a strategy, is, um, you know, it's just a coincidence. White people listen to white people about race more than they do people of color. So we just need, m and I don't think that's the only way. There are 355 million different ways and we need to use all those approaches. But I think one is to have really incredible anti-racist white folks to speak truth to power and to use them strategically. Deploy them, send them out there. Um, let them, um, you know, just like uh, at Ferguson, when the, the um, folks were organizing in Ferguson and the police would start getting ready to assault and uh, the leaders would say, John Brown, they would yell John Brown into the crowd and all the white allies would come and stand in between the police and people of color. That's what we need. We need white folks who are clear about how racism is at work and are willing to deploy themselves. Is that helpful? That's yes, a little very. bit. Thank you. That's a little bit. There's some, there, there's some more stuff too, but I thank you for that question. And I want other folks to respond too because you all are doing this work. You know what it feels like and looks like. Um, I, don't, I don't know the mic. Because um, it was a conversation, I just wanted to, to add to that. Um, there have always been white folks. There have always been people of all faiths that have um, been working together towards freedom and justice. So I think like we need to keep that in, in our history. Like the fact that in Ferguson people were yelling John Brown, right? Like that that's because that that's a that's a, a real person who existed and was uh, in solidarity and in work. And I think in movements for justice and freedom my experience has been there's always been a multicultural solidarity and connectiveness that exists. And so if that isn't the experience that you're having, it's maybe because you're not operating in that way. And, and Moot Asada Shakur was freed from prison and the way she got out was white women were driving that van. It wasn't Black Panthers who were driving that van. And so I think that's always existed in movements for justice. Agreed, absolutely. I hope I didn't say anything other than that. Uh, absolutely, I think that we just need to keep um, uh, that tradition. Because uh, what I do, uh, I'm in agreement with you. I have a, all of my white friends are anti-racist. I'm very familiar with anti-racist white people. It's just a coincidence. All of my friends that are white are anti-racist. Um, <laughs> but I would say that I'm, 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 aware, I'm aware of that tradition, um, absolutely, starting all the way back from the abolitionists. Um, what I don't see happening, though, is oftentimes I don't see white people afraid, uh, uh, as aware of that history and leading from that perspective. Oftentimes I see white people leading from a different, you know, like, What's my role? What's my voice? Where should I intersect? What do I do? Help me. And I think that there is a history of um, anti-racist white activism. I'm in agreement with you. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Claim that history. It's a powerful one. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, you all have yeah, I just want to say this as, as a person of color. So I'm, I'm a black woman. I'm from the south side of Chicago. I also have, some people know I have a hidden disability. So intersectionality is a huge part of my life. And I was lucky enough to get that training and that analysis in my early 20s with training with the People's Institute and starting to work on social justice and community organizing. 
But I, I, I really just want to want to want to emphasize that for me, it is not enough for the people in this room to have a shared analysis. It is not enough for the people in this room to have a shared analysis and the communities that we work with to have a shared analysis. The institutions that we work in also have to have that analysis. And there is nothing more re-injuring, more re-traumatizing than to be in a community working for racial justice on behalf of a theater and then to go back into that theater institution and experience the same racism, the same sexism, the same ableism, the same heteronormativity, the same classism, it, it really puts the people of color in your institutions who are doing this work in an awful position, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. So I really want you to think about that, especially the white folks in this room. Can you push for your institutions to have that EDI training, the anti-racist facilitation, you know, what, whatever, whatever that looks like for your organization and in your communities? It's, it's so important that organizations not only focus externally, but also look internally as well. So, um, some of this is absolutely f amazing, what's being said here, but you're preaching to the choir. You're preaching to the choir. And so my question is, what strategies can you suggest or that we can talk about that will intersect with people who are not part of the choir? In other words, we saw this wonderful play you're standing on last night, and it was preaching to the choir. The people who need to see that, the people that that play needs to intersect with, how do we reach people who are not receptive to begin with? Because those are the people I'm thinking we really need to intersect with. Those are the people we need to reach out to. Not, I, I will bet you that 98% of the people in this room, if you took a poll, are all on the same page. So where do we go from there? Yeah, I don't. I hear people saying maybe not. Thank you. That's what I want to do with the rest of the time. And we may not be on the same page, but we may. So there's a difference between the power that we share while we're building our analysis and, you know, the good old boys club, right? Which for me, and I'm, I'm glad this is where the conversation is going because, I, again, it is preaching to the choir. And some people just opted not to show up to choir rehearsal, right? Because they have their own <laughs> separate meeting. And I, let me frame this by saying I love TCG, I love the staff. Hey, Teresa, I love you. Um, but you know, there's this separate meeting called the Governance Conference, right? Where the room looks very different, the conversation is very different. Um, and, and I've only been one year, I should frame that. Um, but I don't think there's an integration of the conversation that we're having today in the same way. Um, so there is another choir rehearsal and another meeting um, where the good old boys show up. Um, and they have a conversation. So what I would like to see and be a part of and think through that strategy to where some of these convenings, um, you know, we can be having the same conversation and affecting the power structure, right? So understanding the power that we hold as people, we can be decision influencers, but the de decision makers show up in a totally different room um, and have a totally different um, conversation and they are happy to send other staff to have this conversation because they don't have to be here. I have a story to tell, but I want to get other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Uh, I'd just like to add to that that the assumption that we are all singing the same note as well in this room is an assumption as well. Um, that we are all at different levels at this choir, um, and we just heard from someone who's a person of color explaining what that feels like. So even within community, defining what community, a lot of us know that community engagement means just bringing people of color to your theater. And we are here and we're at the forefront because we are protecting our communities. So even with the assumption that we all come with goodwill, we're all at different levels in this room. Um, so I just do want to throw that out there. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I, I, would, ag I would agree. I, don't, I, I have just never been in a room where we are all s uh, sharing the same analysis and have the same level of experience with these conversations. I think that we're just, yeah, so I appreciate that. Um, so again, I think just branching off and, and, and slightly, it's a, 
I think to, to address the question that was asked, um, with all everything else that has been said in mind, like I just think it, to a certain extent, these things have to start becoming non-negotiables in conversations. Like if if the conversation remains like, hey, this is the education everyone should get, and not, hey, this is the every the, the education that we're all going to have to get to operate, like then it's still negotiable, and I, and I mean the organization I work at is not perfect, but I do appreciate the fact that it is it is a non-negotiable that these conversations are taking place in some way. And the results are not always something that I'm like, I like that, but at least I'm like, I've made my point enough to the fact that I see documented change and there's a timeline for when I expect to see the final results of the situation. And maybe that's not an option for everyone, um, but there have to be processes involved where these things are just non-negotiables so that this is not just talk anymore. Because then I think, I don't know, like I, I, long story short, I work in uh, prevention, and I think Milwaukee has seen its one of its largest outbreaks, but it's been a long time coming because it's been consistent talk. And it's nice to see people like, oh, we're committed to this, but again, like the people who are affected are not on the TV screen, they're not being talked to. Um, and like it still feels like this is a negotiable conversation about having race and a talk about prevention, instead of, okay, now that we, it's documented, you got your numbers, even though like theory has said this forever, um, what are the non-negotiable steps we're going to take to address it? So that was just my thoughts and on it. So I want to pick back up the, co the conversation quickly. I, don't, I think we're getting close to time about um, you know, who's in the room and who needs to get the, who, who, who should be in the room for these conversations. And this is where it gets really, this is the challenge. You know, I, I said, um, well, there are 355 million ways to do this work and we got to do all of them, take all the approach every which way. I w so this is the, this is what is very difficult because I, believe me, I give a lot of thought to this and I try to figure out how do we do this work with some measure of integrity and we don't keep reinscribing the same thing over and over again. Uh, and I'm not saying that this is right. For goodness sakes, if everybody, you know I'm not gonna be the person to fix all of this. So I mean, we're in this together, right? So I'm gonna put something out here and I don't know that it's right, but I'm just sharing with you what I'm thinking and what we've been trying to do. Um, one thing is to take a multifaceted approach. So uh, for example, um, the work with um, uh, some of the training institutions now um, that YSD um, and Brown Trinity and some others are creating a core competency around this issue so that the generation of folks coming out of these learning institutions who can impact the field uh, will be different. So at uh, Yale School of Drama, every single solitary student in that program has to have this conversation. It's now a core competency. Um, all the faculty and staff have to have this training. It's mandatory. Uh, that's one place to start to change the culture. The same thing at Brown Trinity. All of the, st all of the students in that um, master's program have to have this as a core competency. Um, it's moving into more and more institutions. Juilliard, all of the students, well, just the drama division, all of the students there have to have this. So there's what we're, tr what, so what we're, what we're, pro what we're proposing is there's no way to be an effective leader. I mean, right now we can, we're just working with the arts, but pretty much you can't be an effective leader, period, if this is not a core competency. You don't have these values and the facility to have these conversations. If not, you know, you're, um, you're doing more harm. The, the potential, you're, you're injuring people. So we are building a base of understanding and there are some examples of how these folks, it takes time to plant these seeds and then to see the next generation of leaders moving into a different conversation. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing I, I wanna say is um, I, uh, so here's another example. A group of folks, they're donors. Uh, it's a group of, uh, they're about 25 folks. They um, uh, donate to a very large theater. And they, um, so they are, they're, they're donors. And so I had an opportunity to talk to these donors. And every time I have an opportunity to talk to donors and they say, well, what should we do? I say to them, you should organize yourselves as, as donors and work to end racism. And don't you know, they organized themselves as donors and they are now working <laughs> to end racism. So 
what I'm saying is there are lots of different models, there are lots of different point of entries. These folks now, there's 25 of them, and yes, they're all white and are uh, uh, folks of a certain age, they're probably all over 50, and they give a lot of money to this one theater. And now they are organized not just as donors, but they are organized as donors who are anti-racist, who, who are trying to be anti-racist. And, and by the way, this is if you want to be a part of that group, if, if you want to you know, join that, that donor group, they say to them, first and foremost, you got to go to the People's Institute. Um, you can't be a part of our group. This is an all-white group of people giving a lot of money to um, a, you know, a, a, a theater. And for them, for you to be a part of the conversation with them, you've got to go to the People's Institute to get anti-racism training. Then you can come to our meetings so that you can be a part of our conversation about how to disrupt this and how to support this theater in its own racism. That's one example uh, of what it might look like, getting these folks to address it from this avenue. Okay, so we got these donors all organized now and trying to do that. Then we've got folks inside of the academy all organized getting, folks, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm saying that it's gotta be multifaceted, multi-pronged, uh, and then all of us individually have to do our part. But yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work. Okay, I think uh, I'm looking for oh. maybe one more. Oh, yeah. Hey, Carmen. Um, hey, I, I just wanted to put out into the space uh, accountability as a word that uh, I, I actually, and this is my own personal opinion, I work for an organization, but this is my personal um, expression yeah. at this moment, um, that I, I actually don't feel that we are on the same page. I think there is a lot of forward movement and a lot of alignment of okay. purpose. Uh, but I think if we really sat down and talked about what um, any of this language means, we would have different analysis. If somebody went through PSAB and People's Institute, which is a very in-your-face kind of training, really different from other types of training. Um, so I, I, I worry that we're um, kind of um, equalizing it all and saying we're all coming from the same analysis. Well, actually, we're not, depending on what your lineage is and what your training is. Uh, I think it's incumbent on us to have a variety of types of experiences and work with a lot of different kinds of um, trainers and facilitators to broaden the expanse and the yeah. view. Um, I, I worry that a lot of people are saying, well, I've done EDI training, yeah. and then it's EDI, it's like anti racism light. Right, right. And I, I'm really worried about that Me too. because I think the deep, deep work yeah. is is so much more than that. Absolutely. Uh, and it's connected to the accountability that we have to ourselves, the accountability that we have to each other, and the ac the accountability that we have to our communities. I'm a person of color, I'm Filipino, and so the accountability to my community, right. uh, personally, the accountability to my family, the accountability to the people I work with, the accountability on many, many levels, and it's so nuanced, and I am such an infant in the accountability journey, but I really challenge us all to really meditate on that and see, okay, well, what truly is your analysis, and who are you accountable to, and yeah. what are you saying to the people that you're accountable to? Right, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Amelia. Whoever had the last co question, yes, I think I saw the mic over there.
There's somebody over there that, do you want to respond? Okay. You know, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I do believe that there's going to come a, I feel like we're, we're already shifting in some respect where uh, the question is no longer going to be, uh, this art needs to meet a particular standard or be, uh, at, be at a, a particular bar um, or to be vetted in a different way because it's dealing with social justice issues. I, f I feel that the opposite is going to happen, which is that um, uh, folks are coming to the table, uh, audiences are, are showing up. We, the community, is demanding a greater level of consciousness in what is being produced. So I feel that what's going to happen is that folks are going to say, um, great costumes, great lighting, but we're not standing for this anymore. We're not going to put up with, with, with this anymore. Uh, folks are protesting. Like Folks will be out front and have been out front. We're not going to deal with cultural appropriation anymore. That's done. That's over. We're not, I, I feel that that's starting to happen m more and more, um, that folks are, there's some, on, honestly, folks, I think that there's going to be some work that we just don't do anymore, that we're actually going to say, we, we can no longer do this work anymore. We, this isn't who we are. We've evolved. We have to keep evolving. Um, that's what I think is happening. And this, I'm not saying that this is the, the, the right approach. In fact, I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily advocate for this, but my approach has been, I just, I just want to, right now, and maybe it's because I'm, I'm, you know, they sent me my AARP card the other day, and I feel like <laughs> I'm just getting to the place where I feel like I'm so, I just want to work with the enthusiast. Uh, you know, I, I'll work with the willing if I have to, but I'm not going to work with the hostile. I feel like you are so going to be bringing up the rear. It's a new day, people. You know, we have, the millennials are the most diverse generation in the history. The generation right behind them, are, what is that? Is that the Gen Y? What's it? Is it the Gen Y? The, the Z generation, they are even more diverse. We are approaching history. We are already at the tipping point that says that we're going to have a tipping point. It's irreversible. And we are not, go our palate will not take the racist, sexist, uh, homophobic, we're, we're not going to do it anymore. So I feel that, the, I, I feel that the, the shift is going to be not is this art going to um, uh, appeal to our artistic palate. I think that the shift is going to be um, are you going to speak to our humanity and, and, and not continue to dehumanize us. I think that that's the shift I, I'm hoping for. I'm feeling optimistic it will happen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, folks, I feel like this might be it. Yeah, thank you. What a great room of folks. I guess this is the choir. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all. Uh, we are going to just give you some quick announcements. We're actually going to dismiss our dinner group hosts to go on out into the rotunda, um, and we will meet you all out there. Thank you. Um, I'm Courtney McInary. I'm the, <laughs> oh gosh, no. Oh my gosh, no. Um, I'm the director of community engagement here. We are privileged and honored to have you in our space, and our microphones don't like to be next they to don't. each other, but we like each other. Um, <laughs> And uh, our intention this weekend is to make this a welcome space for you. We recognize that our impact might al not always meet that. We hope that in any ways that we screw up, that um, if you can communicate with us in whatever way feels comfortable to you, we, we hope to uh, 
to solve problems as we can. So we are your problem solvers for the weekend. Um, we want to be as hospitable as we possibly can because we are just thrilled that you are here, um, that these conversations are starting, and uh, that you're visiting our beautiful city. So thank you for being here. Um, we have a, just a few announcements for you. So after dinner tonight, we're about to move into our dinner groups. And I know some of you may not have dinner groups. Oh, I'm Jenny Toutant, by the way. I'm the education director here. And welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, what uh, we are going to do is, uh, after dinner, come back here for the performance of Until the Flood. After act two of the performance, which we hope you will join those dialogues, um, we will be meeting in our Stackner Cabaret for a reception. And really important, which is why I have all this stuff with me, you have in your folder free drink tickets. Okay, so please do not lose those. Okay, the Stackner Cabaret after this performance, you're going to go out into the lobby and then around just to the left outside. Um, some people have been calling it the Golden Staircase. It's our escalators that will lead you to the Stackner Cabaret where we will gather. Also, um, if you signed up for a dinner group, they are on the back of your name tag. Um, unless you have other instructions, some of you did not sign up for a dinner group, which is totally great. And we hope you go and enjoy Milwaukee. It's, there's lots of good food. Um, but if you did sign up for a dinner group, your hosts will be out in the lobby holding signs that coordinate with your name tag. Um, oh, that's Great. Uh, if I can just ask that other folks stay in their seats. I know some people have to get out, but we just want to get you these announcements as quickly as we can. Tomorrow, you have our list of things that we have to tell people. I do. Um, tomorrow, uh, in the morning, we will be meeting in the Quadrachi Powerhouse, which is up the marble staircase. It's something to tell you that you need to go up the golden staircase or the marble staircase. But <laughs> the Quadrachi Powerhouse is up the marble staircase. Um, and that's where we'll meet in the morning. Starting at, We are starting at 9, so please get here a little bit before. If we messed up your name tag or if we messed something else up, we will have your correct documents in the morning. So just know that you can pick those up then. If you have issue with any of your tickets, uh, I'll be standing outside of the Stinky tonight, um, right before until the flood, with a bunch of tickets just to make sure everyone gets the seat that they need. So if you have any problems, please find me um, for that. Great. And without further ado, we're going to release you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. One more thing before we go. Oh, Amelia. Thanks, Amelia. Right. One last thing, I would, uh, well, two last things. I would love for our interns for the weekend to please stand. We have Elena Montz, Connor Finnegan, and Arielle Kay. Um, these folks are, here's Elena down here. These folks are incredible. They are people you will want to hire in just a few years. So um, get to know them. They're giving of their time and energy this weekend. Finally, speaking of giving them time and energy, I would love for the members of our planning committee to make themselves known in the room and for just us to acknowledge all the work that they put into this. Woo! Thank you all for being here. If you have any questions, come find me. Thank you. Thank you. Great. All right, uh, very quickly, go ahead and find your sign. If you did not sign up for a dinner group and you want to meet in front of the coffee cart to see if anybody else would like to join you for dinner, have at it. We will see you at the show tonight.